it is the government of the party in government for INEC and INEC. The only thing that the people need to do, the only role the people have in democracy in Nigeria from that decision is that they should offer themselves to assemble at polling booths so that uh, international observers can take their pictures. So it's a, a Photoshop. The We'll begin this conversation taking our quote from Kofi Annan, who was a Ghanaian diplomat. He served as the seventh Secretary General of the United Nations from 1997 to 2006. He once said, If corruption is a disease, transparency is a central part of its treatment. And I agree with that one. My next quote is from Michael Temer, Brazilian politician, lawyer, and writer who serves as the 37th president of Brazil from 31st of August to, uh, 2016 to 31st of December 2018. He once said, When you have a new government assume power, everyone, without exception, has to work for the benefit of the common good. Okay, I agree with that one too. My next one is from J. William Fulbright, American politician, academic, and statesman. He once said, The case for government by elites is irrefutable. Mm. And my last quote for today is from George Brandes, Australian former politician. And he once stated that historically, it is very unusual after a change of government for the new government not to be returned. Okay, now let's see how this quote relates to what we will be discussing today. Very warm greetings and welcome to D Conversation. We're reaching you from Kaftan's television studio here in the nation's capital, Abuja. I am Annabelle Oji. Now today we will be talking to Solomon Dalonghos, former minister of the Federal Ministry of Youth and Sport, and he also contested in the just concluded elections where he um, contested under the Lantan North and South Federal Constituency. We'll get feedback with regards to the election and what happened during election 2023, the election tribunal, and then the, the judgment or the verdict given by the Supreme Court. And even as we also look forward to the three off-season elections, that's Kugi, Emo, and Bielsa. But remember that Kaftan TV will definitely bring you sights and sound with regards to all that will be happening during that election. That's a very good reason why you should stay tuned to Kaftan Television. Now let's come back to the conversation with my guest, Solomon Dalong. But we'll go on this quick break and when we return, I expect that all of you must have gotten your seats just grab a seat get your cup of coffee your glass of water or maybe cocoa and kose that pap and akara works better for you this saturday and let's have this conversation with solomon dalong ladies and gentlemen welcome to d conversation Welcome back. If you just joined us, this is D Conversation. We are reaching you from Kaftan's television studio here in the nation's capital, Abuja. Now we'll go straight to our conversation for today. And my guest is Barista Solomon Dalong, who is former minister of Federal um, Ministry of Youth and Sports. Great to have you on the show today, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been like Annabelle. ages. I, and you actually look good. You look refreshed. Like after the election, you don't even look stressed from the election, though. And I don't know why you are even looking much better, even though you did not participate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now since we're talking about the elections now, let's um, start in that regard. How would you actually say all that happened during the 2023 elections, be it from the presidential um, election down to the National Assembly and then the governorship election? What exactly would you tell us um, with all that happened from the elections down to the tribunal and then Supreme Court or Appeal Court? Well, I will begin by commending INEC for mobilizing Nigerians uh, effectively for the elections. And um, they also guaranteed Nigerians of uh, very highly credible polls. And uh, we had maybe the 
most effective performance of Nigerians in the election than ever before in the history of our democracy. Uh, but disappointingly, uh, I make like a captain abandoned the ship uh, mid sea oh. and then uh, changed the rules of the games and uh, invented uh, some concepts so strange to uh, our encyclopedia, uh, technical glitch. And uh, of course, at that point, they dump Nigeria, Nigerians, they dump their um, aspirations and everything. And uh, they now started producing results from their offices. Uh, and of course, those uh, results have uh, stood the test of time because the courts have confirmed it. So. The new rules now we have in Nigeria is if you are contesting election, you don't need to go and campaign to Nigerians. Oh, wow. Yeah, you have to go to INEC. Just every campaign should be in INEC offices. Because whatever you do uh, in the field, whatever INEC ends up announcing, that is the election. And the Supreme Court had also affirmed that that INA can change their rules. You can't even hold them accountable from the judgment of the Supreme Court. You cannot hold INA accountable for any commitment it has made during the elections and uh, just turning around to abandon you and do something to the contrary. The court said, whatever INA said, it is so. Uh, we, we have learned so much and we also learned the hard way too from um, the 2023 elections. Because we've learned that um, the electoral empire cannot be trusted and that you don't have to believe anything they tell you because they are free to say any other thing again. And that will be what it is. So the electoral situation in this country now is that INEC is the ultimate. Um, um, whatever the constitution said power belongs to the people and um, they, they revalidate the mandate periodically now has been put to rest the issue is that INEC is election if INEC said okay you who had even gone around campaigning they didn't know you so be it so my appeal to the political class is that we have to live with this new jurisprudence and we will have to redirect our energies to INEC offices. Even campaign trend now should be in INEC offices because you now need to woo INEC to get the support of INEC so that they can declare you winner. But isn't that all shades and color of wrong? If you have to tell your colleagues to do such, that's, that's wrong. No, but it cannot be wrong because it is what the law is now. You got to read the Supreme Court judgment. The Supreme Court judgment said, I make which committed itself to electronic transmission of results. Said you cannot hold them accountable for not doing it. So what happens to government for the people, by the people and of the people? No, the that, judgment that has re, no, the judgment has redefined democracy. Because you, you see, I'm talking, I want to be protected by the decision of the Supreme Court. Because it's the court that has led to raise election issues and has set a new agenda for our democracy so it is the government of the party in government for INEC and INEC the only thing that the people need to do the only role the people have in democracy in Nigeria from that decision is that they should offer themselves to assemble at polling booths so that uh, international observers can take their pictures. So it's a, a Photoshop. 
they must offer themselves for Photoshop. But the real election from this decision, because if you are saying that the electoral empire can conduct elections in complete disregard of laid down rules and regulations, including the rules which I neglect itself, then certainly that is the law. And we're going nowhere because the Supreme Court is the final arbiter on all issues. And that is what the Supreme Court has said. Yeah. So the next thing we will do is to advise people so that, I mean, we don't go and spend our money wasting our time, wasting our energies, uh, uh, try versing the entire political landscape just for you to come at the end of the day and you hear a different thing. I contested the House of Representatives, Lantan North and South Federal Constituency. The results I had from my agent I am holding and what I make declared in some of the pulling units is unbelievable. In my native home, in that pulling unit, I got 140 votes. The next person to me got 65. But I made in their final results, gave me 20 votes. I still hold it till today. In one of the electoral votes, I had 1,450 votes. INEC gave me 130. I can go on and on reviewing uh, this. So when the Supreme Court finally said, you can't hold INEC accountable, I started organizing self thanksgiving, which I will later translate it, for so not even going to court. And I saw myself as a very privileged person that God loved for dissuading me not to go to court. So I did not go to court. I was going to ask that. So why did you not go to no, court? No, 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 no. Did. no, no, no. My, you know, I'm a man of very high instinct, very high and sensitive instinct. And I was dissuaded not, not to go anywhere. But then he who alleges must prove. So why did you not go to court and then prove that you um, feel disgruntled or feel cheated? No, there was no need to go into the chronography, judicial chronography and drama in court when you know what will come out of it. Are you saying that the judiciary is not the last hope of the common man again? No, ju the judiciary as it is, uh, you, do, you don't make it a sweeping statement. Maybe in some other cases, it may be the last hope of the common man. But for the election, it is the last loss of the common man. Because anybody who will want to think that uh, he can get justice through that process, well, people have their... But so maybe, maybe so even even as um, a legal professional in that um, field, what you are telling us is that with regards to their um, election matters, just forget about it. Don't even stress yourself. But when it comes to other matters, then you can go to court. So that it means that the law applies to some people and it doesn't apply to some. Or the law applies to some re for some reasons and to the others, it's a different kettle of fish entirely. Is so that what you're telling us? It's not that even um, what I'm telling you, but maybe I have the opportunity and maybe some elements of courage to say it. But that is what it is. Um, ah. Because we have run a judicial process of elections and it is still ongoing in so many places. Uh, the same matter, the same parties, the same issue for determination 
and the court will say A in one breath, and in another breath, it will say B in election matters. So the summary of what I am putting across is that, I mean, for elections, I don't think I can trust the judicial process. So that means you're referring to yourself also because you're a barrister. Yes. You're not, you don't trust yourself too. The, and you don't trust your colleagues in the field. I did not go to court. So what, what are you looking for? I have this evidence that I've told you now. I still hold them. And I did not go to court. So if the monitor comes out of the water, and announce the date of the court crocodile. Nobody will disbelieve because it's the latest visitor from the sea. So I, I but I did not go to court. I mean, should have been uh, again like the Africans will say that the fall of a green leaf is a warning, uh, warning to the dry one. So uh, the fall of a dry leaf is a warning to the green one. So I think. Uh, mm. All right, so now what would you actually say? Because I hear you keep um, throwing the sledgehammer uh, to the electoral umpire that they are biased according to you. But then most people would say that what is what exactly is the reason why you have hundreds and thousands and millions of electorates go to the polling um, booths, they feel um, they're all geared up, say they want to go and elect or they want to go and vote for their conscience. And then when they return back, Whatever the um, result that it is at that time is not only stated by, by how, many, um, how many times they, uh, uh, people decide to put their thumb where their mouth is by, or where the, the party that they want to um, elect. But at the end of the day, it now goes back to the court. It now goes back to the fact that if the court says XYZ person is a winner and that's, the, that's it, why do we have to go through that route and then go through that route of that six months when you have in other countries, I hate to use the word advanced countries, let's come back to African countries or now. If you go to Ke Kenya or some other countries, it doesn't go as far as how much we uh, go through our own process. So why do we go through all that strenuous process and then come back another four years again or now we have a, an off-season election and then come back to tell people that they should go and vote their conscience but then they are not the last um, arbiter. Well, I am not even saying that INEC is biased because if I say INEC, INEC is biased, I will be very, very fire for using the word biased. Oh, so bias is even an understatement. Yeah, it's an understatement. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because if I say Anik is biased, it's a very fair comment. I think the whole problem lies on the military heritage. You see, the intervention of the military into politics and the reconfiguration of the Lancaster House agreement by the military with their long stay in power created uh, a military, a military polit political culture where uh, dictatorship and autocracy is mixed with some elements of so, or some semblance of democracy and that is what we have in place if you go to the very point of the constitution how to constitute the electoral body it takes patriotic and courageous people who fear God to preside over INEC and do justice. Now, the enemy's power vested in INEC, while all of them were not even product of democracy, they were hand picked by the executive. So how do you lay a foundation of democracy with the people 
who were handpicked to go and preside over democracy. That is the beginning of the problem. I have so many times been advocating that there are models in some places, even South Africa, Electric, ele electoral officials should be elected. Let's use option A4. Everybody who wants to be INEC resident commissioner or chairman should go to his ward and win first an election. Hmm. So would you actually say, sorry, I had to board him, would you actually say same for the judiciary, the Supreme Court? I'm judiciary? coming back. Okay. I'm coming back to it. Okay. Now, after being elected as a ward representative, you go to the local government. At the local government level, whosoever is elected that march there will be the electoral officer for the local government. Those elected will be the electoral officers for their wards. Now, the electoral officers for the local government should go to the state and elect the state electoral, resident electoral commissioner. And that will even come to Abuja. So anybody who won the election, his, his place will be replaced by another person. Now, you have elected people who people can hold accountable. So when they begin to metamorphose into dictators where they break rules whimsically, they can be sanctioned. Back to the judiciary. In America, where we copied this presidential system, we're spending billions of money servicing cost of governance. Judicial officers are elected. So, why did we cope it in part and abandon some? Now, if you look at the accountability mechanism of the judiciary in Nigeria, the Chief Justice of the Federation is as powerful as the President of Nigeria. So, within the three arms of government, every sectional head It's a crown despot. The chief justice is the chairman of the National Judicial Council, chairman of body of ventures. He's the uh, chief justice of federation. He's the chief justice of the National Judicial Council. He's the chairman of the, the National Judicial Council. Now, he appoints all these people here. And that, that, there's no room even for consultation. If he doesn't consult, he can bring anybody. Very, very powerful office. The president of Nigeria is the most powerful in terms of power, constitutional power in the world. The president of the Senate, who is the chairman of the National Assembly. So you have three despotic democratic standpoints where if you smuggle yourself into it, leaving that place is when God wants to remove you. That's our democracy. Now, Ireland has joined the land of it because the court has now coronated another despot. The Supreme Court has coronated another despot and made the whole democratic process so terrible. Because whatever is the dream of the INEC chairman. I see people now going to call the, want to contest in Kogi. Go and campaign in INEC. <laughs> Go to INEC. Oh, no. <laughs> Anybody who goes anywhere, those that are running in the bush in Kogi, shooting themselves. There wasn't that time. Mahmoud will just wake up and then look at one of his professor classmates and send him to Kogi. With a clear the, uh, instruction. And the man will go there while they are, uh, the results are coming in. Then the man will just wake up and tell you, I have declared this winner. Go to court. But Barrister uh, Solomon Dalong, you know that's not how it's done. 
if you have to check, that means you're, you're at least uh, slandering on the INEC chairman. Not slandering. What happened? You, you know, slandering, have they been able to uh, excomplicate themselves from what happened in Adama? Have and the man in Adama was saying that what he did was exactly what uh, the INEC chairman did in the presidential election. What, what the man was slander there? These are facts. These are facts. So what is slander? Is INEC saying that their commissioner, resident commissioner, in Adama, did not declare somebody winner while the, uh, the returning officer was nowhere to be found for the election to be cancelled? Is the INEC chairman telling us that during the presidential election where he adjourned to resume the following money to continue collection of results just for him at 4 p.m. to announce and declare winner. It's not slander. If the if the many of them feels slander, then he should just address these two scenarios. What happened? They might be able to explain to us. So we can't slander them. I have a lot of respect for this institution. I'm only saying that our democracy produced, has created dictators, despots, with enormous powers that reduced Nigerian people to mere elements of a Photoshop. But as to who gets what and how is no more the question of law. Mm. Okay, so I hear you say that um, it should, there should be an election to, uh, if you have to bring in new people, REC's, and then in the INEC, um, the electoral umpire. But then, one would even ask that how much has the election done? Because if you look at even this um, parliament that you talked about, the National Assembly, these people were also elected, but the same people that were elected are the same people that come out to say we've sent um, prayers to your emails, the same people that come out to say that we've decided to buy um, SUVs outside the country because our roads are not motorable. The same road that you represent and you're supposed to fix that road. Isn't that same election that brought those same people in? You're only corroborating what I've said. I have just summarized to you that what happened in 2023 was the fear of INEG is the beginning of wisdom. From the behavior of the elected representatives, it collaborates what I'm saying. No, but you're saying that they should be, the INEC, uh, from the electoral umpire, that they should be elected and not appointed or selected. So there should be an election of people who would um, occupy those offices. But that's why I'm telling you that how much has even election done? No, those people that are it, in it election, you, you, we cannot blame election. No, election is still election. What produce these same people who said we have no motorable roads and they will need uh, uh, armored cars from outside the country? And they also added that there, are, there is insecurity. That is for them to be safe, but not Nigerians. So that they're not talking about Nigerians goes to confirm that you have to go to the gods of Heineck. Their behavior confirm everything. Because anybody elected will always look at the people who brought him and will be accountable to those people. A genuinely elected person. You will always find that in his behavior. He will have some elements of empathy and sympathy. But these same people, this same government, it has also told that it borrowed 500 billion. That is enslaving the future. And the monies were shared between the three arms of government. 75 billion to the National Assembly. 35 or 30 to the judiciary. The rest went to the presidency. That is law. 
Now, after this sharing, the common people, the president out of his love for common people, decided that every household should be given a thousand. every household and he said about how many million he was targeting so when we helped him would i mean how insensitive that will mean that we thought as a father of the nation he should have known that eight thousand after subsidy had been withdrawn will not even be able to pay transport to just so he now reversed we are now having what they are calling conditional cash transfer. Conditional cash transfer, since it was introduced, it is transferred from the government offices into individual pockets. There is no single common man that has come out to say, oh, he is a beneficiary of the conditional cash transfer. Nobody has been held accountable. Nobody has been it has not been investigated it has not been propped but trillions had gone through that the president is repeating the same thing so it's not about elections it's about the product of what i may call elections so i don't want us to demonize election election has remained election it's a process where people go and choose their leaders but in our own clan and jurisdiction here now election has a different meaning and spirit and character that's all what i'm saying hmm. all right we'll do for a break clearly we have more to unbundle from this conversation with Barista Solomon Dalong, and we will definitely get right into it after this time out. Ladies and gentlemen, join us again. When the president is saying, oh, I can feel your pains. He's only feeling the pains in the mouth. But he just kept, they came out to say that he's not the one that ordered for it, for the yacht. Who is ordering for it? It is not enough to deny. When you deny, tell us who is ordering. Oh, it's not the president is ordering. It's Mr. Amadou. We now know who is ordering. You know the president's men, especially those who handle his um, publicity, they are very, very good in escalating problems for him. All you need to do is just even level an allegation against the president they will help you confirm it because their reply will either pro provide a hint as to whether that is true or not or they will help provide you an answer that that is what they are thinking about so that's how they have been able to manage the president Welcome back. If you just joined us, this is The Conversation. We are reaching you from Kaftan's television studio here in the nation's capital, Abuja. If you just joined us, you've actually missed out on a whole lot, but then you can still join in the conversation as my guest on the show today is Solomon Dalong, who is um, former minister of the Federal Ministry of Youths and Sport, and he also contested in the just-concluded 2023 election where he contested um, in the, uh, that's the um, Lantan Federal Constituents, North and um North and, south, North and south north and south constituency all right so before we went on that break we've actually talked about quite a number of things but now let's um go back to let's end on in on that thought with regards to our uh, elections now um the Bayelsa, kogi and Imo state elections and the like you said some of the people who are already um campaigning in the bushes they should just go first of all go to um the uh, electoral umpire first but then how do we read our society of that corruption and the fact that if P 
people came out in their zillions, their millions to vote in the just concluded election, it means that they are tired of the usual and then they want a change. But now this has happened. And then I hear some people say that it has already watered my appetite. It means that next time I am not going to that um, polling booth. So how would we rid ourselves of that, um, that uh, anomaly? And then encourage nigerians that in the next elections even though your candidate did not win in 2023 elections there's still a 2027 election and there's still a 2031 election so they should all come out and shun voter apathy no voter apathy can only be shown by a credible and transparent election when rf was introduced and tested in about 130 elections before 2023. Nigerians built confidence in INEC. People traveled from different countries of the world to come home and register. Mm. We have the highest number of people who collected PVC. About 93 million. 83 between 83 and 90 million. But the results of the presidential election, which was the first election, if you sum up the votes of the members of the National Assembly, is over 70 million. The same people who went and voted for their National Assembly members refused to vote for the presidential election. Yet there were no uh, 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 um, unprinted ballot papers to return. And we have results of the presidential election. A winner with 8 million. And the history of winning election with 8 million in Nigeria was 30 years ago when I was a pulling clerk in the 1993 presidential election where my party SDP won and it was an odd. Obasanjo won election with the top million. Buhari's last election was about 17 and million. When you put the opposition and the winner is over 30 million. Close to 40. And then in 2023, the winner is 8 million. The runners of have 66 million, even less than 30 million. Any right to thinking person, even those who do not believe in God and their consciences, will tell you something is wrong. So the gospel of going to mobilize Nigeria and not to waste their time to go to the police unit. It's a Herculean one. But the Messiah is Anik. Anik must come out honestly. Not this uh, uh, rigmaroling they are doing with the statement they are Oh, we are going to... Who will trust you? Are you saying that there's a question mark to the fact that the Supreme Court authenticated um, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu's election? No, I'm not talking about the question mark now. I'm telling you that if you look at the sum total of the... Because if we are looking at which vaccine do we administer to cure voters' apathy, then we have to diagonize. Hmm. have to diagonize. And there is what is called political hemorrhage. So the, the person, which is the Nigerian people, have lost a lot of blood. Vied the attack by the cancer inflicted by Anne. So it's for you to mobilize Nigerians now. You see the way people are going and people are calm. It's a graveyard peace. It's a graveyard peace. People are just calm 
because Nigerians love this country. Oh. They are not lucky to have a political elite that love the country. But they still love the country. All this shifting of goalposts you see, where they are blaming Nigerians that, oh, they are docile. No. Nigerians love the country and they hate anything that can again plunge this country into crisis. That's why they follow everything. The docility of Nigerians is not that they cannot act. But they are weighing the consequences of war versus peace. Mm. That's, that's, that's all. So don't think that because Nigerians are, they, they swallowed everything you, you, you force down their throat. That, no, that means that they cannot react. No. They're only saying, well, is it worth it? Do we destroy this country now? Put our children into crisis. <laughs> destroy everything for the sake of this. Is it worth it? That's what is calming the people. But not the political class. The, the political elites and leadership at every turn of event insult and attack the people. Look at the, the current budget. Supplementary budget. Billions of naira for the renovation of um, uh, the Dudan Palace. Billions of naira for the renovation of the parking space. A billion of naira for the buying of the vehicles for the first lady. Billions of naira. And all these vehicles are going to be important. The dollar, again, will have to win the war against the naira and shoot up. Because we are going to now sub send the Naira again, naked, to war by importing these SUV vehicles from outside the country. Mm. We are going to, uh, in the budget, there is even provision to buy a yacht mm. for the president. Should all these things contained in that supplementary budget be the priority when the president is saying, oh, I can feel your pains. He's only feeling the pains in the mouth. But he, they came out to say that he's not the one that ordered for it, for the yacht. Who is ordering for it? It's not enough to deny. When you deny, tell us who is ordering. Oh, it's not the president that is ordering. It's Mr. Amadou. We now know who is ordering. You know the president's men, especially those who handle his um, publicity, they are very, very good in escalating problems for him. All you need to do is just even level an allegation against the president. They will help you confirm it. Because their reply will either pro provide a hint as to whether that is true or not, or they will help provide you an answer that that is what they are thinking about. So that's how they have been able to manage the president. And that's why he, 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 any small thing, who if he's not the one who has ordered for a presidential, said a presidential yacht. They didn't say Solomon Dallon yacht. He's specific with the name of a person, presidential, who is the president of Nigeria. So he's not the one that ordered, who ordered for him? Mm. I will bring that question back to you, um, Solomon Dalo, because taking a cue from where you just landed, because you were also in government at the time. But now we see this supplementary budget, so where we see um, uh, the amount of money earmarked to, for renovation of um, Aso Villa. We've seen 1.5 billion naira earmarked for um, the uh, First Lady's vehicle. And I recall that. Um, during the inauguration speech, there was a time she came out to say that her family, they are well-to-do and they do not need um, Nigerians' money, so they can actually provide for themselves. Now, my question is, if they have to renovate that Aso Villa with that amount of money, because I recall that before they moved into the villa it took quite a number of time so it means that it must have been renovated to an extent so i'm wondering why we need to renovate again or why we need to buy more suv vehicles for um the lawmakers 
isn't the one that the one they have is it not can't it actually do the same work because you have also been in government so I, that's why i'm bringing the question to you so when you have a vehicle that has been working over time do you need to update it so that it can be um, used to apply the nigerian on motorable roads maybe you can answer that question for us at least from experience you see that's why the fact that buari's government did not um measure up to the expectation of Nigerians. Buhari's government is angelic. Oh, now he's angelic? Angelic in terms of dealing with issues like the one we're talking about. But most people never agree that at the time. No, I'm just telling you. When I was appointed a minister, I inherited an old vehicle that had been used for about 10 years. It was only refurbished. That was what I was using with all, almost all my colleagues until four months later when one of the vehicles killed our colleague because of just tires. There were no tires. And killed him, his wife, and his son. That the minister suddenly said, no, we have our own personal vehicles that are much, much better. So we go back and use our personal vehicles. I didn't use government vehicle. For all the period I was a minister, I used my personal vehicle. It was three months to the end of our tenure that a new vehicle was purchased. I only drove into it once and practice it, I handed it over to my successor. When we came in, the economy was in recession. I borrowed money from a friend, 50 million, to come to Nigeria and prepare the team for Olympics, which Nigeria got a bronze from football and then we have over 12 goals from Paralympic Games. I borrowed money. There was no money. I was going from pillar to post soliciting for support from corporate Nigeria to fund uh, sports events. The National Youth Games in London the University of London contributed. Some governors donated or contributed and some Nigerians for us to revive the games and sustain it for three years. The budget of government for these games are in public records. The provision for Olympics in 2016 by the National Assembly was 400 million. 400 million couldn't have even bought tickets of Team Nigeria to Rio. That was the budget. And that was Buhari's government. Buhari did not buy any new vehicles. He was using the one he met on ground because we met the economy in recession. And in less than a year, we were able to bring Nigeria out of recession and record 2.70 goals. So why I said Buhari is angelic is that Buhari knew that, I mean, the country was facing a serious economic situation. And he cut the cost of governance. He appointed the only 36 ministers. As a minister... Buhari only approved for two aides for me and every other minister. Special assistant and personal assistant. Any other thing you do after that, you 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 be responsible for it. So are you saying that 48 is extravagant? It's outrageous because when you say extravagant, I don't know where you're getting some of these your concepts. It's outrageous. It doesn't reflect the reality that the government is saying Buhari left nothing for them. 
and yet their behavior does not suggest that Buhari left nothing for them. Buhari behaved in tandem with the reality he found on the ground. Forget about the fact that, you know, I blame President Buhari every now and then that he did not deliver on the mandate. Because what we promised Nigerians as on us, honorable people and honest people, we should have delivered. Buhari did not deliver. His efforts did not meet up. That's all I can agree. But in terms of things like this, no, you can't fault Buhari. Buhari was an angel. His wife, let me tell you, when we came in, one of the problems that started between the president family and some of his closest aides was the reduction of the feeding budget of the state house. When we came in, it was 100 million. Why did he reduce it to 100 million? These are things you can go and find out. So if the president's wife has not said, oh, we are very rich people, we know they are. But we cannot see anything in what they are doing to show that they are rich people. The only person who, has, who we can trust from his body language was Buhari because he said he has nothing and when he made the country in bad shape, he behaved like who he is. But you cannot tell us that, oh, we are very rich people. We have uh, so, so many aircraft. Yes, we know. But we are not seeing anything today to suggest that. Even though they told us um, this administration categorically stated that they met the economy in complete doldrum. That is what they told us. We also met the economy in complete doldrum. Let me tell you, I was in the transition committee that took over government and handed it over to the president. So I have more knowledge of what was in place. We submitted our preliminary report to the president before inauguration and advised him to prepare his mind that he will need like seven trillion to form his government. And the, the Buhari nearly collapsed. And he left that the night for hospital. The night we get this report to him, he left for hospital. When Buhari came back, he had this feeling that maybe because there's no money, there are, there are savings. That was the courage that inspired him. That there was savings. But when he went to the central bank, <laughs> there was nothing. And he came back and said, I thought there was savings. And I now went and they said the place was empty. So, if you are accusing Buhari today of, okay, handing over nothing to you, what did he inherit? Why did he inherit nothing? Buhari's situation was even worse. When we came in, Oil collapsed from $100 per barrel to 35 The daily production from $2 million collapsed to 700000 because of crisis in the Niger Delta. I mm. personally had to go into the creek to discuss with the young people there and sought their support, which gave the stability we had that they had suddenly now turned it into oil theft. But now the um, crude oil is over $80 per barrel. Yes. So there are no reason to say, oh, Buhari left. No. Yes, Buhari inherited nothing. So if he left nothing for you, you will not even blame him. You can't. Oh. The, the, is that what he should be? Because it, he inherited nothing, so he should live with nothing. No. Well, if he did not work hard to leave anything for you, you blame him. You can only blame him. When he inherited something, squandered it, and left an empty place for you. So whatever he was able to mobilize within the ages was his own effort. Okay, so are you saying that if you were elected as um, to, uh, uh, let's, say, let's make it as 
governor of um, um, Plateau State, and then you come in there and meet nothing in the treasury. So it means when you are leaving, it is okay to leave the treasury completely empty? Is that what you're saying? That is not what I'm saying. I told you that Buari did not deliver on his mandate, meaning he did not succeed. Okay, so you accept that he also failed? I said it. Okay. I've, I've been saying it so many times. So, for you now to hide under the cover and think you can demonize his administration, we, some of us, will defend it with the last drop of our blood. We will defend it. I will always tell you, even if it's a, yeah, well, I see him today, like I see always, I will tell him, sir, you did, we, did, we failed. But take this from me. Gwari is better than what we are dealing with. Gwari is far, far better than it. Is it because you worked for that administration? No, I even brought the administration, so not working for it. When you said work, is somebody, somebody that was just picked from No. I was one of the pillars of campaign that brought Buhari. So, and you see, Buhari's failure to, 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 to deliver on his mandate to the Nigerian people, I regretted it and I, I kept talking about it, that it shouldn't have been because, I mean, we, we mobilize the people build the trust in them that we're going to change this country and that we did not change it was, was just bad enough but Gwari's behavior in terms of leadership is more responsible than what we are dealing with now. So let me ask you a personal question. Gwari's son, Gwari's son did not get close to his office until he left. While I was in office, Gwari's daughter, one of Gwari's daughter, told me that she was she's working and she drives past my office to go to her own office so the day she stopped in front of my office she's going to go have a problem with her father but he's a very disciplined man okay so let, let, let us not because he he, he fell fell in one aspect and then everything in nigeria were trying now to dump children no but he is an exceptional Nigerian. Yes, it's shortcoming. Okay, I'm going to ask you two questions, and I'd like you to unbundle them in one breath because our time is fast spent and we're already due um, to end the program. Now, my first question is, you said that um, your Buh President, Buh former President Buhari actually failed, and then you were among those that brought him into um, uh, the administration. Now, is that... As in, would you actually say that that was what one of the things that affected you because uh, when, during when you um, contested that election in Lantan North and, and South? Was that one of the reason things that affected you? Because people would, uh, if you come out to tell us that I brought in um, this person into power, and then you also say that he failed when I brought him, so that means that same um, problem that made that person fail would definitely affect you. So do you think that that was the reason that actually? affected you that's one on the side and then secondly because we're already rounding up i hear i, I attended a particular um a gathering i think it was an a dinner where you stated that um we in sdp that you've actually lost but at least you want to an extent but you can't you will not call yourself as losers because um you're remobilizing yourself to come back again and then i heard you say now we have to look for to look towards the plan b what is the plan b barrister dalong Back to the first uh, question. Till I will bow out, I will admit my role in Buhari's government. And I will state it as it were, that we didn't meet the expectation of Nigerians. That is human shortcomings. As a person, I was not the president. I only believe in his ability to deliver on our collective uh, convictions. But if he fell, we fell. Mm. So that one is what it is. So is what, that the reason why people decided not to whether elect you? Whether uh, that was what affected me at the elections, I don't think so. Uh, 
Like I said about Nigerians, they know people very well. But Nigerians know who Solomon Dalung is. My people know who I am. But just like I said with the elections, and I've advised subsequent people, except we have a radical reform, I've advised people where they should campaign. Uh, because they should all, all road leads to Mahmoud's house and his office. You win election. You will send a professor who will go there and declare you winner. Full stop. That is the election in Nigeria. The court has said whatever he said. And if he does it or not, you can't hold him. That is what the Supreme Court has said. I don't want people to talk about it. It's a court of final uh, arbiter. For the SDP, the Social Democratic uh, Party, we are winners uh, because we gave, I mean, a very serious fight from nowhere. We won so many seats. We, 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 we still are in, in, in contest in the courts and with, with so many things, even though none of our cases had received the blessing of the judiciary yet, but we are still struggling. With it. But we have elected members in the National Assembly, in the Senate, the House of Assembly, chairman and local government from nowhere. So we are the bride of the 20. 23 election. And if Anek had allowed a, a, a free playing ground, would have done more than this. But we have also learned, so maybe we will redirect more energy to their offices while campaigning next. So, so, so is that the plan B? Of course, that should be the plan B. Except something happened, let me tell you. I'm very, very, you know, I, I started politics as a young person at the age of 18. My mentor was one of the greatest politicians in this country, Chief Dr. Solomon Lar. And for over four decades, I was with him. So I've seen enough. I have also lived with our leaders, northern leaders in the north. The last person that brought out was uh, Mat uh, Damas and Nkano. I've learned a lot about this country and I've known a lot about this country. So, Nigerians, very wonderful people. If God will not even admit Nigerians into heaven because of their deed, because of their sacrifices, to tolerate this type of leadership, God will have pity and admit them so that All they right. cannot lose here and lose there. Mm. Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful time having this conversation with you. What a very fine place to anchor this conversation. Thank you so much, to, so, do, um, the, uh, Barrister Solomon Dalong, for coming on the show today. And thank you for the opportunity. Great. All right, viewers, that's where we end this conversation with Barrister Solomon Dalong. It's been a wonderful time here on The Conversation. How time flies when you're discussing serious matters that concerns our very own country, Nigeria. I will definitely see you again next time. Keep watching The Conversation because you never know who my next guest will be or what I will be speaking of next. Till I come your way again, from the nation's capital, Abuja, I am Annabelle Oji. God bless you and yours, and God bless Nigeria. <laughs>